Hi, my name is Kevin Brofflot, and I'm uh, a historian with Army Sustainment Command here at Rock Island Arsenal. And today we're covering victory, the end of World War II and post-war rebuilding. Uh, now, one of the things I wanted to point out with this is that uh, these topics are so dense that uh, this is really just a wave top discussion of this. Um, you know, things like the Marshall Plan or, or um, you know, the rebuilding of Japan or Germany or Europe um, as a whole could be their own discussions uh, separately. So this is just a, a brief discussion of uh, this overall period of time in the end of war or conclusion of World War II and moving into post-war um, time period. So just a little bit of back, uh, backtracking here and, and recapping. So uh, the final push that we, we talk about here um, shows um, the final push to VE Day. Uh, the initial German surrender was actually signed 7 May 1945 at 2.41 a.m. at the College of uh, uh, Technical uh, or Modern Technology at Reims. Uh, the surrender was considered un unconstitutional. Um, however, um, almost as soon as the, uh, the surrender was signed, even before the, the ink had dried on the paper, the Soviets protested that while this is unconstitutional, un uh, Stalin personally said that the Soviet emissary that was uh, representing the Soviet government uh, during these signings was not capable of or was not authorized to accept the surrender. Plus, uh, they were just overall unhappy with where it had been signed. But uh, necessarily... Um, with that said, uh, the document off to the right here is actually a, a copy of the original uh, surrender here, uh, signed by Alfred Yodel uh, initially. Um, this picture actually shows Yodel there in the center on the right, uh, signing the document the Soviet emissary uh, representative at the end of the table there, um, and all allied commands um, had been represented uh, during the surrender um, for however temporary of a time it was. Uh, the, uh, the Soviets agreed that uh, we would have another surrender on the 8th, um, and uh, like it says here, six hours after the first surrender, the Soviet high command protested uh, the act of surrender, saying it was unacceptable. Um, and some of their objections, like uh, I mentioned previously earlier, uh, was that they wanted it in a, a singular, really unique uh, location to show the ultimate victory, uh, it really a symbolic thing too. And where more symbolic than the heart of the German government in Berlin. So the, the location was agreed to um, on 8 May um, to be held in Berlin. Marshal Zhukov, kind of the, the hero of the, uh, the efforts to um, conquer or take Berlin, uh, would preside over these, uh, uh, the new surrender. Um, this was considered a more formal surrender of the German government anyway. Uh, it, it, the irony of it is that uh, the surrender actually took place in the early morning hours of May 9th. Um, however, it had been backdated to the 8th of May as well. Um, and this is a picture showing um, General Stumpf, um, uh, Marshal Keitel, uh, Admiral Friedenberg, um, all there signed the, the formal uh, surrender, like I said, on the 9th, but backdated to the 8th of May 1945, ending uh, World War II in Europe or VE Day is celebrated on the 8th. Now moving to the Pacific to talk about VJ Day and, and the end of uh, the war in, uh, in the Pacific Ocean there or in the Pacific Theater. Uh, the picture to the left you actually see here is the, the lighter area is the, the sphere of influence that the Japanese uh, Imperial Japanese government still had uh, during World War II. Um, the picture to the right obviously shows the, uh, the thing, the ultimate conclusion or the ultimate act that concluded the war, which was the atomic bombings at Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Uh, interesting is uh, this actually shows them flying out of Tinian there um, and the uh, bombing in Hiroshima taking place on 6 August 1945 with the uh, B-29 named Enola Gay. Then the, uh, the bombing at Nagasaki taking place on the 9th of August with uh, the V-29 named Boxcar, but also points out that uh, there at uh, Kokura was its original target. But uh, since it was clouded over, uh, they went on to their secondary target at Nagasaki um, and dropping the atomic bomb there at Nagasaki on the 9th. Um, that ultimately ended the war, uh, or led to the end of the war. The Japanese would actually officially surrender um, on the 15th of August, 1945, or make their uh, make it known that they were going to surrender on uh, the 15th of August, 1945. The official surrender would actually take place, the signing of the documents on the uh, 2nd of September. But as a part of that, what I wanted to point out here is what could have happened. 
And what we see here is uh, Operation Downfall or the invasion of Japan. Uh, it was planned to start on uh, November 1945 and with the main operation taking place March of uh, 1946. Uh, in two different operations here. Operation Olympic would take the, the southern island, Japanese home island of Kyushu, um, and the invasion would serve to support the later invasion at, or Operation Coronet, uh, the invasion of the home islands. So uh, Olympic was to basically take uh, land for airfields in order to support the main invasion there, uh, as well as um, ports of operation and just a, um, a closer op base of operations for the main invasion of the uh, home island of Japan. Uh, as well as containing Japanese forces to the home island. Uh, the Operation Coronet main goal was to capture Tokyo, to total destruction of Japanese forces, as well as conclusion of the war in uh, the Pacific Theater. Now, the numbers are kind of broad here because it, it was an operation that obviously never took place, but it was intended to have approximately these numbers, and some of them might, might have been kind of high, obviously, but in total, it was said that about 5 million U.S. personnel would be involved in the invasion uh, at Operation Coronet. Uh, an additional 1 million British soldiers would take place, or British um, service members would take place. That was a little bit uh, probably high or generous for what uh, British forces would have been capable, British Australian Commonwealth forces would have been capable of um, massing in the Pacific at that time. Uh, however, our, the enemy forces, the Japanese forces, consisted of about 4,300,000 Japanese soldiers in the home islands um, and an anticipated 31 million um, ex expected conscripted soldiers uh, or conscripted civilians, I'm sorry, uh, that would rise up uh, to meet the Allied invasion. So with this, it was an invasion that never took place. It uh, obviously... Uh, it was something that the atomic bombs had stopped and, and fortunately for uh, all involved was that the, the casualty figures that had been estimated for the invasion of Japan were well in excess of uh, a million uh, allied casualties and uh, several million uh, Japanese casualties at that time. So it was important that uh, this invasion never took place. Uh, now, with that said, obviously World War II was one of the most destructive wars that we've ever had in human history, and this chart shows the, uh, the death destruction that had taken place during the war, obviously with the Soviets um, taking most of the, uh, the military and civilian deaths. So the, the red bar that you, that you see to the left are the, uh, the military deaths with approximately, uh, in, especially when speaking about the Soviet Union, um, you know, the numbers are um, ballpark. Uh, so uh, about 10 million um, uh, soldiers died during World War II and, and another um, estimates range somewhere between 20 and 30 million uh, civilians died, Soviet civilians died uh, during the war uh, with the other uh, ca allied casualties uh, going down on the, the blue bar on the left with all the different nations and then the, obviously the Axis casualties down at the bottom there. Um, so needless to say, World War II was devastating in just the human co cost alone. Um, but what you see here is actually a picture of uh, Warsaw, Poland in January 1945. And you can just see that, that this, you know, to complete and utter destruction of uh, a nation here. Uh, millions of people were dead, as we just talked about. Millions more were homeless. Uh, the entire European economy was in shambles. It, it, you know, it was completely destroyed. Uh, European, European infrastructure, especially within Germany, was completely destroyed as well, or well, was mo mostly displayed, destroyed, excuse me. Um, similar conditions in Japan and, and large parts of uh, where the war had taken place in the Pacific Theater uh, were in the same conditions. Uh, captured territories on the, the successful side of this is that captured territories were starting to be freed or returned to their original governance. Obviously, uh, you know, not everything was perfect and not everything uh, took place as everything intended. Uh, there were civil wars that took place, you know, nations that um, obviously took over, such as the, the Soviet Union with its puppet states or uh, uh, states, uh, Eastern Bloc countries that uh, had been taken, land that was taken from the, the Germans after the, uh, um, the Soviet invasion of uh, Germany now, uh, a return attack against Germany. Uh, in addition to um, all this is that as the this, uh, displaced populations began to return home and start the, the long process of rebuilding, um, 
just the utter amount or the the ultimate cost of uh, rebuilding in Europe uh, came to light. And so uh, part of that re uh, recovery or re rebuilding plan was uh, what you see here. There was actually the, the Morgenthau plan, uh, which was originally published in 1944 um, and was was that first step in, in to a certain degree, a, a propaganda uh, or used for propaganda anyway, to talk about how the allies, the Western allies were going to rebuild um, Europe and, and Germany and, and retool Germany, basically. But uh, the large part of the plan was to uh, eliminate all of the uh, Germans' war industries, uh, all, their arms industries, their capabilities to uh, go to war in the future. And during some of the conferences and discussions uh, between uh, the Allied leaders, Stalin, Churchill, and Roosevelt, Stalin had mentioned this plan to Roosevelt saying, well, okay, so you want to remove all of their furniture making, their metal furniture making uh, capabilities? because." It was really easy to reconvert a, uh, a peaceful or uh, peacetime industry into a war industry. So the plan ultimately had uh, massive holes in it or mass or lack of capability for actually just stopping Germany. Um, the it, it, plan also had required cutting up Germany into smaller pieces. Um, it's so, similar to what you uh, what you see after um, what actually took place. Um, after the conclusion of the war as well, um, largely taking part, portions of Germany and giving them to like Prussia, the province of Prussia, and giving it to Poland. Um, the plan was never fully implemented, and a later investigation um, prior to um, its complete um, disposal of the plan uh, found um, that actually 25 million Germans could have starved to death under this plan because if you're talking about completing or completely destroying or eliminating these these different industries, uh, now you have out of work Germans or out of work civilians, and what are you going to do with them? How are you going to keep them fed and, and uh, you know occupied so that they aren't doing other things that uh, could potentially lead to another revolution or uh, you know uh, counterparty power per se. Um, but the plan that ultimately uh, got implemented uh, was a Marshall Plan, or the European Recovery Program, um, otherwise known as ERP. Uh, it was the American initiative to help rebuild Europe uh, in, in every way possible. Um, like I said, it, it replaced the Morgenthau Plan actually getting adopted in 1948 by Congress, uh, approved and adopted by Congress, I should say. Uh, in total, $12 billion were spent during the, the Marshall Plan's time, or in today's dollars, about $129 billion uh, were invested in Europe. And the map to, you see the, uh, to the right here it actually shows where those um, dollars were actually spent in uh, the different nations um, that we were aiding, uh, recovering from World War II. So the Marshall Plan continued. Uh, you know, you talk about these industries and, and um, by the time the Marshall Plan uh, was in place in 1948, you, you, these were the percentages of what you see uh, Europe as a whole uh, or, uh, getting back to what uh, pre-war levels were, or 1938 levels. So most of Europe's agricultural production was about 83% uh, by the time the Marshall Plan started. Industrial production had returned to about 88% and imports about 59%, or I'm sorry, exports. Uh, the exceptions to these were uh, in the United Kingdom, ne Netherlands, and France, where by the end of 1947, uh, they had already returned to full production of 1938 levels or pre-war levels um, before the Marshall Plan had been implemented. Uh, and Italy and Belgium would follow in 1948, getting to those pre-war levels again. Uh, Germany by far was in the worst condition. Obviously the bombings and the, the destruction of their infrastructure was the most dramatic uh, within Germany. Um, having you know, the allied air forces, having targeted German cities um, and with what was known as precision bombing at the time, uh, precision bomb, as we've talked about in previous talks, uh, was something within about a mile of uh, the actual intended target. So uh, obviously civilian populations were uh, largely affected and um, not only the fact targeted in many cases. Um, so uh, Germany was, was hurting pretty bad. And the picture you see off to the right here was actually a protest in 1948, uh, I'm sorry, 1947. Uh, and the, the young man to the left is holding a sign saying, we want coal, we want bread. 
uh, and showing the, even the, uh, the Marshall Plan. If you talk to people there that had been uh, witnessed the Marshall Plan being implemented, they you know they they talk about great things, but uh, but any plan that, that gets put in place is not perfect. Uh, and so there were shortages, there were issues throughout Europe um, in feeding the population um, and feeding them and giving them best, basic necessities at times. But overall, it was that first step to rebuilding and repairing uh, the destruction that World War II had caused. Um, over 12 million refugees uh, flooded into uh, Western nations, so in a, in a large part into Western Germany and then also other allied, uh, or I'm sorry, other European nations to the West. Um, after the Soviets took hold um, in East Germany and uh, the other Soviet states. Um, so not only are you having to deal with the population that uh, survived the war uh, in these locations, but now 12 million more uh, refugees that fled into the nations. Um, so shifting to, to uh, Japan uh, and the occupation of Japan. Um, so like I talked about, uh, the official uh, announcement of the Japanese surrender took place on 15 August 1945. Um, and at that point, the Japanese had immediately began neg negotiations with General MacArthur as to what the final uh, surrender document would look like. Um, and so plans for the occupation and rebuilding of Japan actually started almost immediately. Um, the surrender took place on 2 September 1945. And the picture you see to the right are, is the Japanese delegation aboard the USS Missouri getting ready to, to sign the official document of surrender. Uh, this would actually be the first time that Japan had ever been occupied by a foreign nation. So it was a very dramatic event for the Japanese and uh, obviously the occupying American forces and allied forces coming into the nation. Um, so two immediate goals were initially set for, uh, for General MacArthur in the occupation and rebuilding of Japan. The first was disarmament. Uh, eliminating the Japanese war potential. So it's very similar to Germany in, in taking the teeth out of the Japanese, uh, the new Japanese government for uh, future uh, production of war materials. Uh, second was actually the con uh, government conversion. So uh, the United States really wanted to um, bring democracy to Japan at this case. And uh, so they ended the imperial Japanese government, uh, left the emperor in, in, um, in place as a figurehead, uh, but created a, a democratic government following. And, and, you know, just like with anything is that it's never easy to completely change an entire government system and um, get everything to work right. So even the Japanese had, um, had issues in the occupation. Uh, one of the things that MacArthur had actually issued uh, general orders to his troops coming into uh, Japan was that they couldn't eat any local foods. Uh, and this was primarily because the shortage of food within Japan um, that obviously the American soldiers and, and sailors and Marines that were coming into country were getting rations and they were being fed and to not take anything of the little amount of food that the, the Japanese were getting at that point. Um, Another part of uh, the recovery and rebuilding was returning all the lands seized by the Imperial Japanese government back to their, their rightful nations. And as we will talk about in a few minutes, that led to some post-war tensions. Um, like I said, the, the immediate need was for the well-being well of the Japanese civilians. Uh, first, uh, first and foremost was a, a food distribution network uh, to support the Japanese civilians and keep them fed. Uh, like you see down here below, uh, an author uh, named Kazu uh, said that democracy cannot be taught uh, to a starving people. And so there were billions of dollars of food aid after this food network was set up between uh, 1945 and 1948. Um, in total, in just 1946 alone, <clears throat> $92 million in food aid was given to the Japanese government in form of loans to keep them afloat and uh, alive during this time. Uh, one of the requirements of this food aid and aid in general uh, for the Japanese government was that they would have to uh, f join the United Nations, um, which again we'll talk about here in a few minutes, uh, the new United Nations. Uh, by 1947, uh, emphasis was focused on, uh, was taken off of food because that was pretty much stable by this point. Um, it, was, it was focused on economic stability and growth. So now that you've got the baseline supports in, in, in place, now it's we need to restart the economy, uh, get it to be stable, and um, an economy that could grow and, and 
work with its uh, world partners or international partners. Um, so go, talking about the post-war tensions that I mentioned earlier, um, starting with Europe, uh, most historians agree that the Cold War started during World War II due to high tensions as to what the post-war world would look like and who was going to be the top dog in, in a sense between the, uh, the allies. The um, three major allies, you know, being the Soviet Union, the United States, and Great Britain. Um, most of the Western allies felt that war with the Soviet Union was inevitable. And if you know anything about Patton, he was one of these vocal proponents that instead of uh, demobilizing an army in Europe, that we had to uh, start training the army and prepare it for the uh, eventual war with the Soviet Union that was going to take place uh, in the greater part of uh, Europe itself. Um, by March 1946, the situation was so dire that uh, Winston Churchill delivered his Iron Cur Curtain speech talking about Stalin placing an Iron Curtain across Europe, um, separating the two and, um, you know, basically taking all these Eastern Bloc countries um, under its wings and making them puppet states or satellite states of the Soviet Union. Um, the Western Allies pushed uh, to basically unify themselves uh, and unify Western Europe to have a strong um, economy to try to rival that uh, or any influence or threat from the uh, the Soviet Union. And as a part of that was that they wanted uh, the, the uh, Western allies wanted Western Europe to speak with one voice. Um, so you can say kind of some of the, uh, the, the initial groundwork for the European Union in the way. Um, and so the map to the right shows uh, the dark red to the very far right shows the original Soviet state and then uh, the annexed or expanded Soviet state area, uh, areas of responsibility and then satellite states that you see by 1948 being created with the green lines on the map being new borders that were created um, within the Soviet Union for these satellite states. So going again, flipping back to Asia, um, and, and again, I just want to reemphasize that, like what I said earlier, is that <clears throat> each of these um, topics could be an own talk in their own. So these are, again, just the very tops or tips of, uh, uh, of these discussions. And so within Asia, you have um, the, communist, uh, the communist Chinese influence uh, growing as uh, one of the deals were struck uh, to end the war was that the uh, Soviet Union would invade uh, Japanese occupied uh, territory in, in greater part of Ch uh, Manchuria and China um, in general. And so these the communist influence or the communist Chinese that were there were off, obviously given the support once the, the Soviet Union um, invades and takes over this terrain. Um, again, one of these po the points that uh, led uh, some behind uh, behind the scenes dealings uh, that led to some uh, post war tensions was on the Korean Peninsula, and we'll go into those talks later um, in in future library talks here, talking about uh, the starting of the Korean War. But uh, this was the very roots to that, where at Yalta, or uh, the Yalta Conference between the the big three powers. Um, it was agreed that instead of having a whole Korea on, on the peninsula, that the uh, Korean uh, peninsula would be split into two with North Korea and South Korea. The Soviets would occupy Northern Korea and obviously the U.S. and allies would occupy Southern Korea. Um, another Yalta deal, which we'll see here on the next slide, was that um, in agreement for the Soviet invasion of uh, Japanese occupied territory, that uh, the Japanese Kuril Islands would be and uh, South Sakhalin um, Islands would be given to the Soviet Union following the conclusion of the war, uh, which those islands are seen here. So you see to the picture to the left were the total uh, Japanese area of influence by 1855, 1875, and then uh, the very la or the far left line, 1945, were the, the islands that were taken back uh, by the Soviet Union during the uh, Yalta Conference. The, the picture to the right are basically the, the main islands of um, um, that caused the tension. And even till today, that uh, after the Soviet Union dissolved and the, the, the Russian state now, the Japanese government and the Russian state still have disputes over the Kuril Islands um, and ownership of those islands, saying that uh, you know they were not properly handed off to the Soviets during the, during the, the Yalta Conference or at the end of the war. Um, with that said, 
Uh, one of the things that efforts to make um, a, a lasting peace and uh, to maintain that peace was the foundation of the United Nations. Um, we did have a very similar uh, situation after World War One, where the League of Nations had been founded with a strong supporter of uh, Woodrow Wilson, uh, president of the United States at the time. And that was an effort to keep the peace. However, because of the punitive measures that were put onto Germany and um, you know, following the war, as well as many other, uh, a thousand other economic and political factors that went into it. Um, the League of Nations uh, basically lost power over the, the intervening time between World War I and uh, 1939, and, and was largely defunct by the start, uh, roughly the start of World War II. Uh, but it took until 1946 to officially dissolve uh, the League of Nations. Um, again, the United Nations was formed with basically the same idea uh, to maintain uh, international peace and to talk um, friendly between uh, different nations that were involved in the United Nations. So the United Nations was formed officially on 24 October 1945 and uh, later adopted the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, which the uh, when the United Nations voted on that, uh, the Soviet Union abstained from uh, the initial vote. So. Uh, the picture to the right, you can actually see here um, labeled out between the, the blue nations, which are uh, the um, dependent territories of the uh, in, uh, United Nation members um, and member countries. Um, and then the, the green states were uh, both dependent uh, territories of the United Nations and League of Nations as well. Um, so uh, that was basically the formation of the, of the United Nations. And so before getting too far into uh, talking about Cold War or going into the Korean War, we're going to end that here today. And uh, we look forward to um, hopefully talking to most of you in person and uh, during our next talk and covering more of the Cold War era um, conflicts such as the Korean War. So thank you very much for joining us today, and we hope to see you soon.